Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Policy Review Committee for Wednesday, April 15th, 2020. In accordance with the mandated direction of the State Superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel through April 24th, 2020, in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. The Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting stated that in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in cons consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical abs presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's policy review committee meeting is being held remotely and is being broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Clark, will you call the names of all committee members? I'm not sure where Ms. Clark is. I think she may be having trouble with her phone. Um, I can call the names of the committee members. Uh, Mr. Offerman? I'm here. Ms. Pester? Here. Ms. Rowe? Here. Ms. Scott. Here. Ms. Causey. Here. Ms. Causey, a quorum of the committee is present. Thank you. Would you also call the role for staff members that are participating in today's meeting? Dr. Zarchin? Yes. Ms. Lewis. Here. Dr. Nieves. I'm here. Ms. Causey, those staff members are present and on the line. Thank you. The first item on our agenda for the Policy Review Committee is the approval of the minutes. The live video footage of the February 3rd, 2020 meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. So the minutes stand approved as recorded, and those are available online, bcps.org, on the board's page. The second item on the agenda is policy 5552 under unfinished business, and it is the use of personal electronic communication devices by students. And for that, we ask Dr. Zarshan and Dr. Nieve uh, to present. Dr. Zarshan, if you can please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, this is Mike Zarchin. And I will begin with a little bit of a background or overview and then work with um, Dr. Nieves to present. Uh, first, the, earlier this school year, the Policy Review Committee asked for a policy to address cell phone use. Uh, as I begin, I wanna thank Mr. Offerman for his leadership and interest in this policy uh, from day one, it has been very helpful. Uh, to help guide with this policy development, a stakeholder survey was conducted, and as part of the discipline work group, 
uh, multi-stakeholder work group with staff members throughout BCPS, feedback has also been provided. In addition, there has been a review of existing policy around the state of Maryland, um, which has helped uh, develop this rule. Uh, so with that, I will have Dr. Nieves give us some more information regarding policy 5552 as it is in draft. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin, and this is Amalio Nieves. Uh, so just to uh, add a little bit uh, to Dr. Zarchin's remarks, um, if the board will remember uh, when we did the stakeholder survey, uh, the, uh, the survey uh, consisted of stakeholder groups that included parents, students, teachers, and school administrators. And there were a wide variety of experiences um, as well as concerns addressed, uh, addressing the use of cell phone by students. And one of the common themes uh, that we recognized was a piece around uh, consistency and, and that all members valued uh, the use of technology by students for instructional purposes. But again, I think the theme of cons consistency was important. Um, the other piece um, that Dr. Zarchin alluded to was uh, the piece around the discipline work group. Uh, and we presented to the discipline work group the draft policy that the policy review committee has before it today. And uh, some of the, the and some of the discussion and comments there again uh, among administrators and teachers uh, was this uh, this theme around consistency, um, and uh, the board members, I mean um, the the members of the discipline work group, want to support the board's uh, desire for a cell phone policy. They just uh, want to make sure that, again, that there's, uh, there's a degree of consistency, but also that discretion is given to teachers and administrators on the use of policies. Um, and there's some concern about being able to enforce uh, uh, the, the policy and, uh, and the rules. Um, so again, that's, that's just one of the concerns uh, brought up. And, I think the other piece that came up, which was important, was um, this concept of uh, reinforcing uh, digital citizenry. And we do address some of that through our technology acceptable use policy. Um, but that was important. Uh, important. And also, I think uh, a key theme, uh, what are we also asking of adults in this process if we're asking of students? Um, and so this uh, piece around modeling for students uh, what the expectation is. So I just wanted to share that. Um, before you, you will see um, the, the draft policy uh, for your consideration. Uh, it really, uh, the, in the, the, the statement, it speaks to the board's beliefs uh, about the beneficial role that technology can play in students' lives. But again, um, considering that it must be done in the context of responsible use, and that it should not interfere with academic instruction, student safety, um, and a positive uh, school climate. Um, you'll see there that uh, we uh, provided some definitions in terms of instruction all day, uh, the, defining what a portable electronic communication device would be, and we try to cast as wide a net as we could, um, and, uh, and, and, and with the understanding that Technology changes uh, constantly, and so we try to cast as wide a net as we could for that. Um, and then understanding that as, as we develop any rule that would uh, accompany uh, any policy that we would consider what is school property, what are school uh, sponsored activities, and defining those pieces more clearly in any rule. And then um, a key term that we added was the word, uh, the term use. And for this policy, it's being in the possession of a portable electronic communication device, which is not powered off or set on silent mode, and that is visible to others. Um, and in terms of the standards, uh, 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 we uh, 
we outline or we are proposing uh, that the use of portable electronic communication devices uh, be used, uh, not be used during instructional time unless classroom teachers or instructional staff, we again wanted uh, not just limited to classroom teachers, but if students are working with other staff, um, we wanted to make sure that then uh, that they are setting the parameters in terms of when those devices can be used. And again, reinforcing the, the piece that the use of any device shall not interfere with the instructional program and that it's consistent with our code of student conduct and any other policies and rules including uh, policy, 60, policy and rule 6202, which is acceptable technology, acceptable use policy for students. And then um, ensuring that students have some uh, responsibility and ensuring that when teachers and or school leaders or instructional staff are limiting the use of technology, that students then are ensuring that the phones are out of sight or in silent mode and that any violation would be subject to uh, our uh, to disciplinary action as outlined in uh, policy 5550, which is student behavior code. And um, we do have um, in the student handbook, there are consequences outlined for the use of electronic devices for non-instructional purposes, um, and also uh, for misuse of the technology acceptable use policy, which is policy 6202. Um, the last, uh, uh, the, the other pieces in terms of standards, just um, this, uh, this feeling among stakeholders about responsibility that, um, that students are responsible for their phones and if they're gonna have them on, on school campus or at school sponsored activities, um, that they are responsible for the phones, whether that be loss, unauthorized use, or destruction, or data fees. Um, and then the last piece, ensuring that um, on an annual basis, the superintendent is uh, advising uh, students and families of this policy and any accompanying rule. Um, the other piece that I wanted to address was I know that um, Mr. Offerman had asked about um, uh, pieces that re, uh, uh, restrict allowing for more, and if, if, if I can just pull it up, um, about more restrictive practices that deem necessary by a principal for their school with approval of the area superintendent. And, um, and there was a, a question specifically around, uh, I believe it's yonder packs and, um, and, and then the use of, of the device for individual students in special circumstances um, for a specific period with the approval of the principal. And so our analysis of policies and rules across the state showed that the, the rule is where we will get into more specifics. As I reviewed um, the rules and policies across the state of Maryland, uh, we, we saw some common themes in the rules which allowed for specificity to grade level. So there, for example, it might have spoken to at the elementary level, this is, uh, uh, these are the guidelines for, for use of, of cell phones at the elementary level, at secondary level. Um, these are the, the guidelines. Um, then guidelines were specific for what classroom teachers had discretion for, as well as what discretion uh, school administrators would have. So teachers, uh, in, in the majority of rules that we reviewed, uh, classroom or instructional staff would have purview over the spaces where they are uh, carrying out instruction, whereas administrators have more discretion in other areas of the building and could also designate areas where the cell phone could be used and as well as specific times. Um, and so we, those are things that we believe would be uh, clarified um, more specifically within um, the superintendent's rule.
Thank Ms. you, Dr. Cox, may I ask a question? How are we doing this? Uh, yes, Ms. Pesture, I'm going to go around the dais, our virtual uh, dais here, and uh, get discussion from each committee okay. member. Thank you. Did, yes, and I did want to point out to those that are uh, following along the live stream that, or on the TV channels that all of the documents are available on our website uh, if folks want to pull up those documents and review the draft policies that we're discussing. They're at bcps.org, the board leadership page, and under committee agendas. Those documents are all available online. So, Ms. Uh, uh, so I'll just go around the dais. Mr. Offerman, do you have any discussion? Uh, yes. First, I'd like to thank the staff for all the work they've done. This has been a long process, and they certainly have done their due diligence in setting up research and information. I do have a couple of concerns uh, at, at this point, one of which is the difference between turning off a device and putting it on silent. Am I correct uh, in saying that if some, if, if device is on silent, uh, text, text messages still can be sent and, uh, and, and also received? Yes. Okay, well, then, well then, then I have a concern then because I think one of the issues here was, was, you know, was stop inappropriate communication from, you know, people not only in the class, but people within the entire building or, or even outside parents. So I'm, I'm concerned that maybe the, the, instead of having those two pieces, it's, it's just, it should just be turned off unless special circumstances are, you know, involved. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make this uh, as consistent as we can. And I'm trying to do it with, for the two purposes of improving instruction and the, by doing that is by minimizing uh, disruption, not only for the student involved, but also for other, uh, other, uh, uh, other uh, classmates. Does that, does, am I wrong on that or? I wanted that, to ask you, I'm looking at, um, um, in, in the standard section, so uh, Roman numeral three, um, Section C, which is line uh, 31, where, it's, right. uh, where it says it is the student's responsibility to ensure that the PECBs are turned off or set on silent mode and out of sight. So in both cases, so either they're turned off or if they're set on silent mode, they would be out of sight. And so I'm wondering, would that address your concern or do you, uh, or do you feel that it should just be turned off and out of sight? Uh, I I would prefer, and it's just my opinion. I welcome input from everybody else on the on the, you know all the other members. I I I I think turned off is is the way to go because it you know it it takes away because it takes a few seconds to turn them back on you know and, and reboot and all that. I think that would minimize the uh, in my mind, it would minimize the uh, allure of, uh, of a student, you know, w while supposed to not be in, in sight, you know, getting it in sight in some way, uh, in, in order to uh, in, in order to check uh, check check messages. That's that is uh, that's just my opinion. I concur. Okay. Ms. Cosby. Yes, Ms. Rowe. So just as, as an aside note with this, because we have had some discussions about cell phones and discipline and whatnot in the task force meetings, there is a strong push among parents to not want the phones powered off because parents feel like they need to have some kind of access to their kids and the tracking software that's on a lot of phones doesn't work if the phones are powered off. So I think that if we could theoretically demand that all the phones be powered off, but we don't have any way of enforcing that because you can't know if they're just on silent or they're powered off. And I'm satisfied that if the student is seen with a cell phone that they're subjected to discipline policies because at the middle school that two of my kids go to, 
they have already implemented on the school-based level what is essentially this policy, and it does seem to work very well without necessitating powering off the phones. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Other board members with, or Mr. Offerman responding to that? Yes, may I speak now? <laughs> is that Ms. Pestor? Yes, it is. Certainly. Thank you. All right. Um, I agree uh, with Mr. Offerman in terms of tracking. Um, know that even though you may turn off a tracking device, that now phones are such that um, uh, anyone, if there's an emergency situation, the tracking can be um, turned on or accessed. But uh, I understand that some parents might want to have it on uh, for emergencies, and so that leads me to something um, that I wanted to say, that there are times I think we should consider when uh, Mr. Uh, Nieves gave uh, the guidelines that sort of go back to the school, that there are certain holes and areas that schools need to consider. Uh, certainly emergency circumstances uh, would be one of those holes and that schools really should create a mechanism. Um, and I shared with Mr. Offerman something that we used at Randallstown um, when folks knew that there was going to be an emergency situation. Now, I do agree that sometimes emergencies happen and you don't know it, and so you might need to uh, get in touch with a student, and if the phone is off, that might be a problem. But that is one of those holes uh, that I think folks need to talk about um, maybe we need to talk about it and on the school level because a phone can ring and the student can say it is an emergency situation and then what? If you know there's an emergency situation, there's something that you can do at before class or in terms of the office, et cetera. So I think that is something that needs to be addressed. Also, I want to... Um, just respond to uh, the piece of unless it's used for a part of, as a part of the instructional program with all of the things uh, that as a system we pay to have. I am at a loss now as to what that cell phone uh, would give a student or a teacher that they should pull it out during class. And I just want to speak to things prior to being on the board that I got from teachers um, and even a couple of parents who's, because their children got in trouble about this, is that um, once you open that door to use in the classroom for instruction, if it is something that is connected to a skill or a base of information that is not, and the teacher is not requiring, just like they do with the calculators, then you have a difficult time when it comes to a test, et cetera, about the use of it or it being out. And I found that there were way too many what I call strong conversations between adults and students about having that phone out. Um, so I also think we need to consider or have more discussion about which time you would use it um, for instructional purposes. Again, as I said, with all of the equipment that we pay for for Baltimore County teachers to be able to use. Um, but again, uh, whether it's on or off emergency situations and also the idea of using it for instruction, those are two issues that I think need more exploration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And is Mr. Rashid on the call? Okay. Um, Ms. Rowe, you commented on that. Ms. Scott, do you have comments related to uh, Mr. Offerman's uh, concerns of phones being off versus off and away? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, 
I guess for me, um, where the difference is, is and I, this may have been said already, but how would we know if the phone is off and away or just off? I guess what I'm saying is, is um, and maybe you could clarify this, what you meant, um, Mr. Offerman, when it's off, it's off, but we could still see it, or is it off and it has to be like in their locker, so it's it's away and physically turned off? Is that what the goal is? No, my uh, my my uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hoppin here. Uh, my uh, my my idea was to be off and out of sight. I don't think it needs to be in a locker, but I, I you know I still am leaning in my own mind thinking that off is going to give us less disruption. Over the okay. long haul, and I and I share Miss Pasteur's concern that, given our our nature of of the expenses of the devices and the fact that on the devices we, of course, have, have built in you know technology to screen out inappropriate sites, okay, as well as we don't communicate between devices typically uh-huh. to work in the school setting. That again, I I, I you know I, I, everyone has phones. Everyone will have phones. I understand that concept question is how should they be used in 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 an educational setting which is a whole which is sort of the whole point of this uh but you know so i have i have real concerns about that uh again still okay. but i i think they can have them, having them on their possession is fine uh, you know but I, I think off is still is still is still where i'm leaning toward you know and I, again uh and when you say I, off you mean not person. vibrate or anything no i mean off okay because who's to say I mean, let's, let's let's say we have it on silent and 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 and, and it's on vibrate. And I know there's potential for an emergency situation, but what do you think is more likely to happen? Somebody at, at a lunch shift or in a hallway or somewhere else is contacting a student about something that's not critical or an emergency, or do you think a parent emergency call is you know again the concept? In my mind is still focused on minimizing disruption. For the student, for the uh, for the rest of the class, and certainly for the uh, for the uh, a teacher. So that's okay. why I'm on that point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Thank you, Miss Scott. This is Miss Causey, and I think um, one of the uh, suggestions that I might make and ask Dr. Nieve or Dr. Zarchin to um, respond is on page two, uh, paragraph labeled F. It says use, as you mentioned, Dr. Nieve, the definition of use is for the purpose of this policy. Use means being in the possession of a portable electronic communication device, which is not powered off or set on silent mode, and that is visible to others. One of the questions that was asked earlier, and maybe what needs to be done is to clarify paragraph F, that the key is that it is not visible to others and it is either powered off or set on silent mode. Um, Because I do hear from Ms. Rowe the issue about family tracking issues and parental concerns. So could you respond to that suggestion so if I, I could touch on that just quickly from our discipline committee um, or work group, one of the things that came up from some of the members was the desire for language that they could support. Uh, so the discussion went not knowing if it's on or off, if it's out clearly and they hear a ring or see somebody texting or typing into the device, it's, it's, most likely going to be on. So the, the big push for the group was it for to be out of sight and not being used. They could easily enforce that. So the enforceability was the key to the language and that the visibility yeah. was, the, was the key there. Yes, that that was part of it. Uh, Dr. Nieves, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but that was a piece that stood out to me in our work with the the work group. That's exactly it. Because, again, I think some of the concerns, especially among school leaders, 
there's so many variables to consider, um, and and so they they just wanted to have some parameters that they could work with, and that again it would be easier to enforce, in their opinion. May I jump in, Ms. Causey? Yes, Ms. Pasture. Okay, um, if this comes from teachers and people who uh, uh, would have to do the enforcement, I, I, I'm sure I understand um, that they do not want to get into an argument with someone about was it on, was it off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think in that regard, if that is the case and it remains in the language, then it is incumbent on the school uh, administration and staff to make some decisions or, as, as it was stated earlier, have a guideline so that if it goes on, whether it's a vibration or whatever, um, and we see an infraction as a result of that, then the teacher also is not put in a precarious situation that the ruling inside that school is clear. Because I've been around long enough to be able to say to you um, very clearly that children, when they want to meet a friend in the restaurant or fight or whatever is about to jump off or something is going to happen and they want an attention, then that cell phone is used and the child then asks for a pass to go to the restroom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then you have a whole um, a different situation. And I know for those of you, if you've not been in that particular situation in a school as part of the staff, that might seem picky, but please trust me when I tell you, and I think that, um, Mr. Offerman can certainly speak to that, that um, those things do happen. So as long as we, we say, because I don't want, we don't want to put any more on teachers, and if they're comfortable with that, um, I can give in to that as long as the, the administration has a school ruling that says, or something in our language um, that says, if, however, in its silent mode or whatever mode, and even if you can't see it, it is used in commission of or connected with, then there are prescribed consequences. But certainly, if teachers are fine with it, okay. And I understand their perspective. Ms. Pastor, thank you for those comments. And, you know, just let it be noted that uh, your educational experience and Mr. Offerman's are greatly appreciated on this committee and on the board. I do also want to reiterate what Dr. Nieve had mentioned earlier, that the policy is the overarching guideline for the school system. And then the superintendent's rule will have in it more of those operational and administrative uh, concerns that you're addressing, which are very important and will flesh out for principals and teachers uh, the exact procedures and processes that they'll be implementing in the schoolhouse. And I thank you for making that distinction because I can assure you, and I'm sure Ms. Dr. Zarchin and Mr. Nieves also, Dr. Nieves also can point out um, the same thing that folks often are concerned that there are no school rules attached um, to what we say are our systemic policies and they feel left out on that level. And so schools must do that. So I appreciate the notion that in doing the rule, uh, it gives schools that flexibility and insight into how they fill those gaps for their particular school. Thank you. Ms. Causey, uh this is yes, Amalia. Yeah, I wanted. I just wanted to. Um, I hear um, uh, some of the board's concerns around um, 
pieces again um, that revolve around consistency. And, and as I've been thinking about the comments from stakeholders and then listening to comments from the board, uh, I, 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 I'd like to offer that as we work on the rule and then we go into implementing rule that we have our uh, MTSS resource teachers that work with our schools on developing uh, guidelines um, within the schoolhouse and, and we've got our team uh, that's uh, redoing the positive behavior planning guide that part of our work can be we can offer to schools some guidance on how they would go about it within the schoolhouse to uh, to uh, to get a level of consistency among classroom teachers among um, administrators so that then as we see guidelines from school to school, it can address some of the concerns that are being brought up. So just um, something I'd like to offer. Thank, thank you. you. And this is, I'm sorry, this is Makita Scott. I, I did have another question. Um, would this be included in the student handbook that the students sign um, once we the policy is, is confirmed and everything, then would the student handbook reflect what um, if it's you know off and out of sight, and if the student is caught using it, then what the repercussions would be, or that. And Ms. Is Scott, this is uh, this is Ms. Halley. One of the reasons that, uh, for lack of a better term, this is being pushed at this point is that is so that it can be placed in the student behavior handbook, and students can have um, an introduction to it when they are given the training about the student behavior handbook and about which infractions um, would uh, net consequences. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And Mr. Offerman, I didn't, I just wanted to uh, close the loop with you on this. Uh, are your concerns satisfied at this time with the wording or did you want to make a specific motion that the committee can consider before we move on to other uh, discussion regarding this policy. Uh, I'm 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 okay at this point. I'm fine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I did I, have. I do, excuse me. Uh, I do have an an uh, an uh, additional concern that I that I want to address at some point. Certainly. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you know, as I read the policy and I, I try to, in my mind, differentiate between school rules or between superintendent's rule and the policy and how it's actually done in school to school, I have been in several uh, middle schools to which cell phones, in one case, are not allowed at all in sight at any time, okay? I have another middle school where cell phones are allowed to be used during the uh, lunch periods. Uh, and, you know, so uh, I guess I'm asking is, is will, will the policy be able to generate a rule to allow those principals to, uh, to continue those practices? Because from what I'm hearing from the principals and some other people in the, you know, in terms of stakeholders, is it that, that, that they get a lot of support from the parents, that the parents recognize that, that you know, that, that, the, that, the, uh, that the phone use can, can often be very, very negative in terms of that. Am I am I wrong about that, or, or is that correct? So this will help guide practices in schools. In fact, in the discipline work group, that was, I think, the, the biggest piece of appreciation that this was being worked on was it would lead to consistency. That work group was also you know, providing feedback and development of the student handbook, and that's how this came up in our discussions uh, through the work group. Okay, fine, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. I had two uh, quick questions related to the policy. In page one, paragraph B, portable electronic communications device under the definition, um, I just wanted to clarify that earbuds, whether uh, they're Bluetooth or wired, headphones, again, whether they're Bluetooth or wired, those are included in the definition of portable electronic communications device. Is that correct? 
this is Amalio Nieves, um, and that is correct. Uh, I, I think part of it was, it's, again, it'll say it's, 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 uh, it alludes to speakers, but also worn or transported by an individual to receive, communicate, or record voice. So I would say that, yes, it's covered. Okay, thank you very that. much. Go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I agree, and that's, that's how that got into that section, was concern about specifically the earbuds and wanting to address that. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Zarshan, because, again, going back to Ms. Pasteur, as a former school administrator, we want to make it clear for our administrators um, when they see students in the hallway and they ask them to take their earbuds out or, you know, whatever the direction is from a teacher or administrator, that it's very clear um, that they have the authority to do that. So thank you for that. The other... Uh, brief thing I wanted to bring up is on page two under three standards, paragraph C. I just wanted to make a change. Uh, it is the student's responsibility to ensure that PECDs are turned off or set on silent mode and out of sight during times of unauthorized use. I, I wanted to make a motion to change the wording to out of sight during times use is prohibited. I think that just makes that a little clearer. Is there a second to my motion? And then we can have discussion. Second, Mr. Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion from board members or staff? I think I need you to clarify your that. thinking on this a little. I, I think it, the language is not clear whether the students are using it unauthorized as opposed to making it clear that it is the student's responsibility to ensure that their personal electronic communication devices are turned off or set on silent mode and out of sight during times use is prohibited. Okay, so is that the difference between having to seek authorization specifically to use it, or is it just a case of understanding when it's prohibited and not using it during those times? That would be included in, in, yes, that would be included in what I'm trying to achieve. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor, uh, please say yes during a roll call vote. <laughs> I'll go down the roll call. Mrs. Causey? Yes. Mr. Opperman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Rashid, did he join us yet? No, yes. he's not. Ms. Rowe? Not. Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. The last um, modification I wanted to make to the policy is on page three, paragraph G. The superintendent shall ensure that all students and parents are advised annually of this policy and implementing rule. And I want to make a motion to include the word employees so that it reads, the superintendent oh. shall ensure that all students, comma, parents, and employees are advised annually of this policy and implementing rule. Second. I'd like to make that motion if there's a second. Second row. Board members or staff, is there additional discussion? If I could have a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Opperman. Yes. Ms. Pasteur. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Thank you, that motion carries. Board members, are there other comments, questions, or uh, suggestions related to this policy? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I wanna go back to 
of the instructional use of this. Um, Dr. Zarchin and Dr. Nieves, when you're working on that rule, I really think that something needs to be said about that just in terms of how a school uses that and handles that because I am telling you there are administrators who are adamantly opposed to using the phone for instruction and that it can create problems and there are also teachers who are adamant about it and if you're going to use it for instruction somewhere, maybe it's the school ruling, somewhere it has to be said um, that this does not include uh, for testing purposes so that even if it's in a teacher's head that it's okay, that a teacher, going back to what Ms. Causey just asked, and staff, the prize of, of the policy, that they are clear if they use this for instructional purposes, they must be clear, the children must be clear, everyone must be clear that these are for uh, it's only for information that is not tested information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get my point. This is uh, this is Amalio Nieves. Uh, as I was thinking about your question, uh, some of the examples that come just quickly to my mind is uh, students sometimes, uh, as well as adults, will sometimes use the cell phone with their notes. So, so if they're presenting in front of a class, they might be using their cell phone and their notes or a poem that they may be uh, reading. or uh, So they may be using it, uh, uh, the phone in that manner instructionally. Another practice that I've seen in classrooms is that teachers will have students use their cell phones um, if they're going to be voting on something or they're going to be responding to questions that are being posed, and then they're, use, uh, they're, they're linking to uh, some kind of app or website where the, 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 they're all voting or responding to questions posed. So those are just the, some examples, but we can certainly look at uh, the rule and, and, and add some clarifying language there. I am. I, thank you, and I am certainly aware of um, those options. Um, I've certainly seen those in practice, and those are not the ones. Of, and, and 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 that's why I'm asking that something be included that makes clear that kind of thing. That is that's very um, different. I have seen way too many teachers who have used the used cell phones for instructional, real instructional purposes, um, as opposed to some of the items that uh, they have at their disposal, instructional items, et cetera. And I have seen where there have been issues when the children, particularly, I have to say, in math, and I understand that not everyone could you get paid by calculate, those calculators, et cetera, et cetera, um, but we then need to address those particular needs because you have issues if children are allowed to have those phones out. You have no way of knowing whether, in, in my conversation with Mr. Offerman, we talked about how uh, questions, answers, Etc. are shared. You have no idea what children are typing. So I'm simply saying that the only caveat for all those things you just said, the only caveat is that they may not be used for testing purposes. That's my big one. And that doesn't have to be in the policy, but it should be stated somewhere. So so again, teachers are not put in a precarious situation, nor are administrators, nor are parents, et cetera. Thank, Thank you, Ms. you. That's helpful. Thank you. So Dr. Zarshan, we'll rely on you to carry all of those uh, comments and concerns with you um, to the superintendent as uh, you and he and the rest of the team develop that superintendent's rule. Thank you. We'll see to it. Thank you. So if there is no further discussion, may I have a motion to approve policy 5552 as amended? So moved. 
Second. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Ms. Pasture, was that you with the second? At past Ms. Pasture will second, yes. Thank you. Ms. Clark, may we have a roll call vote? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Pasture. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Okay. Board members and uh, committee members and uh, staff, I really just appreciate all of the efforts that have gone into uh, making this uh, first uh, cell phone and uh, policy. I know that uh, TABCO and other uh, employees have been uh, interested in this in terms of, as Mr. Offerman said, really improving instruction and preventing disruption. So again, just thanks to everybody for moving this work forward. Moving on, the next policy for review is policy 5561, school use of reportable offenses. And uh, for that, we also have Dr. Zarshan and uh, Ms. Lewis. Thank you very much again. Uh, before I turn it over to Ms. Lewis, I just want to give a bit of background here. On February 3rd, the Policy Review Committee recommended that this policy be revised. Uh, with the goal being to assure that the policy contained language to address the safety of all students. And with that, I will pass it over to Ms. Lewis. Good afternoon, April Lewis. And so in consideration of the charge to add language to the policy that would assure the safety and security for all students, Two definitions were added to the policy, appropriate educational programming, and the definition of reportable offense. In addition, in Section 3, the standard section, under Paragraph B, there were three items added to provide greater guidance to school, to schools. Um, one, ensuring the rights of students who have been charged with a reportable offense are protected. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and I do apologize, in that paragraph number two, there is a comma missing um, after the word student. And so it's determining whether the presence of the student poses a threat to the safety of the school, students, others, or the educational process. And finally, developing a plan that addresses appropriate educational programming and related services for students, uh, this being students who have committed a reportable offense. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. And once again, I'll go around in order to get comments, questions, or uh, motions for any modifications. Mr. Offerman? None from me, please. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? No, thank you. Is Mr. Rashid with us? Okay, Ms. Rowe? Yes, I just have one question. How is this policy expected to balance out special education rights with the potential placing of a student with a reportable offense? So hypothetically, if you have a student who commits a reportable offense and it's determined that that student is a threat to the safety of the school? Does the fact that that student may have an IEP prevent the school system from moving that student to an alternative placement? If otherwise a student without an IEP in the exact same circumstance would have been? I'll answer that. So each school would establish a committee that would look at the particulars of the student and one of the things that they would consider is whether or not the student has an IEP. So along with um, individuals from special education who would best be able to speak to the educational needs of that student, then a plan would be developed around that particular student's needs. So there could be a possibility that if the student's needs could not be met somewhere else, that that particular student might not be uh, removed. We'd have to look at each on a case-by-case -case, um, basis, but doing everything that we can to make sure that both the student's educational needs are met as well as the safety needs of that student and other students in the school. Further, 
Ms. Rowe, does that satisfy your question? Ms. Yes, Rowe? it did, thank you. Okay, do you have additional comments or questions? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Ms. Scott? Um, no, I didn't have any additional questions. Okay, thank you. I had just two quick things. One, I really appreciate uh, staff going back to review the policy and strengthen it to support the boards and also to support Superintendent Dr. Williams' stance on preserving school safety and climate for our students, but also for staff and the entire school community. So I really appreciate that work. I did have one um, motion that I wanted to make under, on page two, paragraph four, implementation. The board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. I wanted to make a motion to include, to provide a report annually to the board. Is there second. a second to the motion? That's, second. Who is that? Rowe. Ms. Rowe. Thank you. And is there a discussion or questions from committee members or staff? I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Garzi, I was still on um, FAPE, which is what happens, the uh, public education for, uh, for special aid. Um, can you repeat what you said? What are you asking? Yes, I made a motion to add to page two, paragraph four, implementation, uh -huh. where it states, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. The uh -huh. motion is to include and provide a report annually to the board. Oh, fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cosby, this is Margaret Ann. I do yes. have a question as to what the board's expectation would be in um, an annual report. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Well, we would leave it up to the superintendent to uh, define the entire scope of the report, but it would include the um, evaluation of the implementation in terms of the number of students that this had been applied to and the uh, outcomes of those decisions in terms of students being moved to an alternate uh, education path. Is there any other discussions or questions? Ms. Clark, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Board members, are there any other additions or uh, questions before I uh, ask for a vote on policy 5561 as amended? Hearing no further discussion, May I have a motion to approve policy 5561, school use of reportable offenses, as amended? So Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there a second? Second, second Ms. Rowe. Was that Ms. Rowe? I called to second, but if she came in first, that is fine with me. Nope, that's fine. I'll put it as Ms. Pestjure. Thank you. Next time we'll flip for it when we're all, when we're all together again. Um, thank you for the second. May I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Pasteur. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. The next item on the agenda is policy 2380 records information management, and for that we call on Ms. Howie. 
Thank you, members of the committee. And prior to going forward, I just want to ask if Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Nieves, and Ms. Lewis can be excused from the meeting. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, April is Record Information Management Month. And it was so declared several years ago by ARMA, which is the Association of Records Managers and Administrators. And I'm sure if you share that with your friends, they will be very impressed. So with respect to policy 2380, this policy was returned to um, the policy review committee from the board, but there was no express direction provided to uh, the committee as to what the board wanted to have happen to this policy. And there was also one question from Mr. Um, Offerman about the policy, specifically about whether or not uh, there should be a separate electronic records manager uh, from uh, uh, the other records manager. And I did provide to the board, I apologize, or to the committee, I apologize for the lateness, uh, but uh, early this afternoon, um, some information from NARA, uh, and that is the National Archives. And the National Archives are required and do mandate all of the records management procedures and practices for federal agencies and micro agencies. And NARA does not uh, recommend that there necessarily be a separate uh, individual who is the electronic records manager and the paper records manager. And as a matter of fact, what the federal government has moved towards uh, with respect to its permanent records is to a fully digitized uh, records system so that all records that are permanent and have to be transferred to the National Archives are required to be digitized. Uh, so that is a response to Mr. Offerman's question. Um, I am available to answer other questions about policy 2380. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And one of the aspects of having policy 2380 uh, come back to the committee was to allow additional time for board members, the full board, to review the policy and bring forward any uh, questions um, or comments such as was received by your office, and we appreciate you getting that answer for us. Um, just quickly, I had one uh, suggestion, and then I'll move around uh, the committee members to see if there's any additional questions or comments. I did want to make a, a small change on page four, line 29, paragraph B, implementation. The board directs the, I would like to make a motion to change that to state the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. The reasoning is that is consistent with our other policies. Um, and so I just think it's cleaner and more consistent. Is there a second? Second. Is that Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe, yes. Thank you. If board members could please state their names um, as we're engaged in this virtual uh, meeting. Is there any other questions or discussions about that motion? I'd like to hear your amendment pl again, please. Certainly. Page four, line 29. Right. Paragraph B, implementation. My motion is to replace what is there with the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? Ms. Clark may I have a roll call vote, please. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And now going around the committee members, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Are we talk, are we taking a vote on the on on on, on the motion or? No, I just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity. If there's no. any other comments. No, I'm, no, I'm fine. And I'd like to thank Miss uh, Miss uh, Miss Miss Hal for uh, for her uh, for her comments. Thank you. Miss Pestor, you're welcome, sir. Uh, no, other than the information we got this afternoon was very helpful. Thank you. Is Mr. Rashid with us? I just don't want to miss him if he's able to join. Okay. Ms. Rowe. I have no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, so what we're doing now is we are, I just wanted to um, understand we're voting or we're about to vote on policy 2380 to have um, additional record management support? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, because now I'm just looking at it. And um, this has changed because this would be basically an additional record management uh, support person who would work with Ms. Howie. Is that correct? I don't know if that's the way that the policy is contemplated. So if that is the board's desire, that can certainly be um, that can certainly be clarified. But there's already in Superintendent's Rule 2380, which was approved in 2018, there is already a records officer position um, in that rule. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And the hmm. the um, Policy Review Committee is not making a specific recommendation as to the records officer. That would be up to Dr. Williams to uh, review when he revises, if he chooses to revise policy 23, excuse me, when he uh, reviews, pol excuse me, rule 2380. So that uh, operational administrative issue would be up to the superintendent. Okay. All right. Thank you both for that clarification. So again, um, now that that's in in my brain, I've heard it's in my brain. We are simply looking at we're voting on what the policy in essence currently is that there is process, rhyme and reason. There's no addition in terms of an employee. Um, uh, is that correct or incorrect? So this policy does not direct the superintendent to hire a new employee. Is, okay, my, I guess my question was not stated well. It is to actually, this is just a, a, a reiteration of what our policy mm -hmm. in terms of managing, maintaining, uh, retention, et cetera, of records and process, identifying, guidance, procedures, I'm looking at all the words, preservation, protection, and all of that. Is that correct or not? I mean, is there something I'm missing so, here? I so thought I understood it until questions came up. Excuse me, Ms. Pester, my understanding that uh, is that the board wanted to accomplish several things. That, um, first of all, in the eMERGE report, um, the consultants noted that there was no board policy, so there was no um, there was no direction explicitly issued by the board concerning the significance of records and information management. So that the one of the goals was for the board to state what its goals were, what your goals were. The second. Um, uh, piece that came out um, the last time that the committee discussed this policy was that the committee wanted um, explicitly stated that it was important to this board that there be some sort of training component that was included in the board policy. And lastly, what the committee stated at the last meeting 
uh, I do recall um, both Mrs. Causey and Mrs. Rose stating was that uh, they wanted the exemplar policy to be the policy that is in place in Howard County. So with all of those um, directives and with all of those guidelines, that is how this policy was written, even though it was written after the superintendent's rule. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I remember specifically asking, I'm sure, about the Howard County one, so it, it's a model. And is, is this differing? See, in my head, I'm thinking the superintendent came in and created a rule. Are we shaping the policy? Did the, is this like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Are we part of uh, creating a policy around, I guess, around now what the superintendent did, because as I recall, we did not have a person, and that person now is April. I, I feel like I'm missing a piece here. I thought I understood this when I left at the last meeting, and I thought I understood this while I was reading all of this. Um, but I feel like I'm going down a road now that is unfamiliar to me. So I do need more clarification here. And if you could please let me know what your specific question is, I'll do my best to answer. I want to know this policy is, all right, here's the simplest question. I'm going to start right back at the bottom. This policy is firming up for us what we did not have before but was recommended for us to have? Is that a yes or no? I don't think that the eMERGE report uh, indicated uh, specifically the content of a policy. I think what the report indicated and pointed out was that there was not. And you as the board tell us which way you want the administration to go. You shape the vision. And there was no vision shaping statement or no principles that the board had articulated to guide the administration. So the policy was, as recommended initially by Emerge, was a way to articulate what the board's vision is with respect to the significance that this board has placed on records and information management. That was my understanding. I'm, and because this came out of this committee, if there, there is something that staff has misunderstood, please feel free to, uh, to amend or correct my statement. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey, is there anything you can say that will bring this back to my mind because I've looked over it and looked over it and I, I like I said, I thought I understood, but maybe I don't. And is there something you can add that would help me here? Thank you, Ms. Ms. Powell. So if, if maybe a, a just the, the other thing I might add is just an additional piece of background, and I do thank Ms. Howie for her explanation and for the work of staff to bring, bring us to this point. Uh, prior to, uh, I believe it was November of 2018 or the fall of 2018, uh, there had not been a specific rule related to records information management, and so a rule was developed, but it did not have a policy. So similar to the uh, cell phone policy that we passed uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, there had been individual rules or school procedures, but there had not been a overarching board policy. So the uh, policy review committee um, felt that based on the iMERGE report and also best practices of other school districts around our state, that it would be appropriate at this time to develop this policy. 
Okay, so it does go back to the question I asked, that we had a rule, but we had no policy. So now we've created a policy to embrace. That's why I said the chicken or the egg. Is, so it, 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 that's what you're supporting, what I said then. Is that correct? That yes. we now have a policy, a working policy here that encompasses the rule as opposed to the policy first and then a rule emerging from it. Is that a click fair? Thing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. You're welcome. So, Miss. Uh, so where are we? Okay, uh, Miss Rowe and Miss Scott. Did I give each of you an opportunity to speak? I have no question. Yes, you gave me opportunity. I you, and you already clarified it. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I don't have any additional questions. Okay, thank you. So may I have a motion to approve policy 2380, records information management as amended? So moved, Ro. Is there a second? I'll second it, Ms. Causey. Is there any additional discussion? Ms. Clark, if I could have a roll call. Yes, Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Opperman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. The next item on the agenda is uh, item three, new business, and we do not have new business at this time. Uh, the last item is item four, committee general good and welfare. And I will go around and ask committee members. I did want to just bring to the attention of the uh, committee and staff that last night at the board meeting, we did vote as a board to add reviewing and updating our equity policy, which is policy 0100. So we did want to initiate that process. Um, so uh, the, Ms. Causey? Yes. Uh, just to update the uh, the committee, um, policy 0100 was on your calendar for the 18-19 uh, school year. It was removed because MSDE uh, indicated that it would be uh, issuing uh, a new regulation and that was initially republished or to be republished no. in March, no. but then and then no. adopted in May. The, um, the state did not um, issue in the time that we thought they would. They republished and, re and approved um, ultimately in late October, and that is uh, at 13A0106, Educational Equity. At that time, staff convened uh, a work group and was not only rewriting the policy, but also uh, rewriting the, uh, the superintendent's rule. They're still working on that. Uh, so they do anticipate that uh, they'll be able to, once uh, they uh, have completed the rule, to bring the policy to you because they have put quite a lot of work into the, into the rule. So that is what staff does anticipate being able to bring back to you. Thank you for that information and uh, for the update related to the MSDE regulations. Um, and so what is the time frame that uh, staff is evaluating at this point? Post code. And uh, Ms. Clark, I do not remember when Dr. Williams said she could bring the policy to us. She said she needed at least um, three or four more weeks for the rule. So we can put it on for June's agenda. I think, and Miss, I'll give Miss Scott the opportunity to expound more uh, on the comments that she made last sure, week. Sure. But I think it. I think um, 
in in some areas when we have been evaluating policies, uh, for instance, the discipline policies, we received input in uh, in advance of the finalization of a draft. And I think that maybe that's where uh, Ms. Scott was headed. Um, and so it may be that there is a agenda item that is added for a board member input and we can open it up to receive email input from key stakeholders around this uh, very, very important and foundational policy to the school system. Um, so with that said, I, Ms. Scott, I wanna open it up to you with your thoughts for having um, it on the May agenda and what you would see as the uh, scope of that. Yes, thank you for that, Kathleen. Um, so um, we are, I looked at our previous policy, which um, was in 2016, and as Ms. Howie said, um, there are the new state board has the new requirements, uh, COMAR 13A, and we do, I put together based on what we had and based on the new requirements, just something that I was hoping, I guess the way I, I thought we could do it is get input, um, uh, just have a draft and get input from our community, um, hopefully our, our stakeholders, other board members, so that we have a robust and really um, inclusive policy. It, um, it, it wasn't something I was envisioning that we did over the summer. What I was hoping was that we as a committee would be able to work on this um, before school let out, at least to get the discussion started and to have the community and um, the administration and uh, Dr. Williams and everyone a, a part of it. So what I was hoping was I, I kind of put together a draft. I didn't know that um, when you said Dr. Williams, you, are you referring to Lisa Williams? Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Lisa Williams. Dr. Lisa was, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, so that's wonderful that if she's already working on something, um, maybe what I could do is email the committee along with Dr. Lisa Williams and yourself and everyone um, a draft of something, and then we can uh, work together to maybe have a discussion over a working draft in May. Would that be possible? So... Uh, before items are brought to you as policy review, they go through cabinet, and that is a process that um, okay. requires prior to going to cabinet to go to ATM. So that's why my recommendation as to what staff can do would be June. Okay. So what would exactly happen in June? In June, the recommended policy from staff would come to you in the same way that you've received the policy that you received today. Okay. You would get what has been uh, approved through cabinet and, or, and prior to cabinet through ATM. Okay. And then we would review it at our June meeting, which presumably will probably be virtual as well. I don't know in what format it will be, but yes, ma'am, that is when you would be reviewing it as the committee. Um, okay. Once the uh, committee's drafts are, um, are done, once they are approved by the committee, um, they, I mean, well, they're up now. They're, if you want um, some sort of comment prior to, but usually your comment period um, begins at the end of first reader. Okay. Okay, so then if it sounds like want, and it, mm -hmm. If you want an additional comment period to be built in, that is certainly something that, you know, staff can make happen. Um, I don't know that we need an additional comment period. Um, so if that's what um, what we're working in, and then it would be up by June, then that's fine. May I make a suggestion, uh, given the um, time frame? Our meeting was originally scheduled to go until two, and we've had some really wonderful discussions that have taken us over our time, and I appreciate everyone's flexibility. Um, would it be 
okay with the committee and staff if we have an item on the agenda in the May meeting, which is discussing the process for the development and approval of policy 0100. At that time, Ms. Howie would uh, have more time to prepare where they are in terms of the academic team meeting and Dr. Lisa Williams' work and so forth, and, and have more time to give us an update of where they are. And then, Ms. Scott, any um, suggestions that you would have around community input or board member input, if you could put that together for the PRC committee and staff, and we will uh, also have that directly go to Dr. Uh, Daryl Williams, the superintendent, so that we can all collaborate and move forward uh, together in an organized fashion. Does that, uh, I'd like input on that suggestion. Well, uh, I yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a good suggestion. This is Makita. Thank you. Other board members? I'm fine I'm with fine that. With awesome, man. Ms. Pasture, did that's you have? Fine. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Howie, um, so if we could have an agenda item on the May Policy 0100 equity, just an update on the superintendent and staff's work on that, and then board members, mm -hmm. including Ms. Scott, can also go into that discussion, mm -hmm. uh, comments and suggestions. Surely. Okay, thank you. Now, is there anyone, any other um, input from any other board members or staff for committee general good and welfare? Okay, hearing none, I appreciate all of the flexibility and patience in having our first virtual policy review committee meeting. And while we are still uh, fighting the fight of COVID-19 oh. pandemic, we encourage everyone to stay safe stay connected and uh, to please go to the bcps.org website to evaluate any of the resources that are available, whether it's for food and nutrition, uh, mental health, con continuity of learning, or any other thing that uh, is required by our community uh, to please connect with us. So thank you very much and the meeting is adjourned. Yeah.